Good morning. It's good to be with you again. I was here, Tracy and I were here August 8, and at that time we had the privilege of uh, um, bringing to you uh, Pastor Marcelo and Dion and Samuel and uh, introduce them to you and you to them and to see if there might be a little bit of a fit that would work, you know, and, and uh, you must have thought so, and they must have thought so, because they came and uh, stepped into leadership here in the pastoral role at Laurel. And uh, before I go any further, I just want to say, for Tracy and I both, it's always a privilege for us to be here. You're a loving church. Um, you always make us feel welcome. The Holy Spirit is present in the songs and the stories and the spirit of all of you. And so... It feels good. We travel a lot. We're in a different church every Sabbath, so this kind of feels good to be here because you have a positive spirit. And so thank you for allowing us to be here today and part of it. One of the things that I like to do as a ministerial director is have an official installment of the pastor and his family. And the reason I like to do that is because it's not all about the conference saying, okay, we hire you, go work there. It's about all of us recognizing that we have a responsibility to ministry in a given area. So Pastor Marcelo and his family are here to lead, but your church family is here to work with them to accomplish the mission of the church. The conference is here to support you and the church and to together to accomplish the mission of the church. It's easy to think sometimes that the placement of a pastor is just sort of some random decision made by some committee somewhere. And I want you to know that more important than any decision a committee might make is the decision that the Lord makes. And that we all together recognize the calling of a pastor to a lo local given church in the leadership of that church. So for those reasons, um, it's important to me to have this installment time. now. Pastor Marcelo has been here since the 1st of October. Uh, we planned this one other time, and then there's this thing called COVID that's going around that has given us fits. And uh, so we had to cancel that one. So it's a little bit later than I would normally do an installment. But uh, And then this week, of course, of course, poor Samuel fell and got hurt. And so I thought, uh-oh, we're going to have to postpone it again. And I was talking to Pastor uh, this week. I said, I don't think the enemy wants us to have this little installment service. There's always something that's coming up. But um, thank you so much, uh, Dion and Samuel and Pastor Marcella, for desiring to go ahead and move forward, even though they've had a difficult week. I appreciate that. And uh, so what we're going to do is a responsive reading. It will be on the screen here. I'm going to invite Rennie to come up and as... Uh, head elder of the church. He has a, a, a responsive reading part. And then, Pastor, you're welcome to, you have to come up. And I don't know, Dion and Sammy, you're welcome if you feel up to it. If not, I, we understand. Um, so there's a part for each of us. And by each of us, I mean not only us up front, but you as a congregation as well. And you'll see it on the screen as we work through it. Uh, the first reading will start with um, Rennie as the elder of the church, and, and then just watch the reading up front, and when you see it's your part, the congregation part I'll kind of help with so we're all together. Um, but the point behind this is for us all together, the conference, the church leadership, the pastor and his family, the congregation all, to responsively say, uh, welcome, and we are joining together in a special way to move forward the kingdom of God. So let's do this together. I know it's kind of... Ready, go ahead. We come on this day to open a new chapter in the history of our church, the beginning of a new pastoral. We have received gifts from God who has equipped us for ministry and provided a new pastor to lead and encourage us. We come seeking to serve you in lifting up Jesus Christ, that together we might grow. 
we invite you to lead us in our walk with God. We seek your love as we become part of this church family. We wish to have you as part of our family, and we open our hearts to you. God has given to you the challenge of leading these people in their preparation for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I accept this challenge under God. I pledge to do my best always to lift him up. As a church, you face the challenge of presenting the gospel to your community. We accept this challenge to present the living Christ through our lives and our ministries. We covenant before Christ and each other this day to place Christ first, to seek the guidance of His Spirit, and to work together for the hastening of His coming. If you guys would just stand right here, I want to have a special prayer for you guys. And Randy, would you mind, I'll pray, and then would you have a prayer as well? Dear Heavenly Father, we come today recognizing that uh, Pastor Marcelo and Dion and Samuel have been called here by you. And as we recognize that, we also recognize that we live in a world and a community that has huge challenges that no one person or one family can meet, Lord. But as a congregation, we can truly make a difference to impact this community for your kingdom. And so to that end, Lord, we ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit on Pastor Marcelo, on Dion, on Samuel. We ask, Lord, that you would set them apart in a special way, give them the gifts and the abilities that they need to meet the needs of this church family, but also, Lord, to lead them in reaching this community. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we first come before you with praise and thanksgiving, Lord, that as we look around the world in which we live, in the chaos and the uncertainties, Father, we know that you and you have all things in your hands. Amen. And Father, through your guidance and your leadership, Father, you have brought Pastor Marcella and his family to us, and we praise you for that. And Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray that it will fall upon our pastor, upon our church, upon our congregation, the Father, through these last days, that we may uplift the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, yes. the Lord of a lost and dying world. That there is hope, hope, Lord, beyond this life, hope for an eternity with you. Yes. So, Father, again, may we, each and every one of us here in this church, pledge our support, Lord, to the pastor and his family. We ask your blessings upon them richly, Father, the Lord, that the enemy will come against those who stand for you. So, Lord, put a hedge about them. Lord, again, we love you and thank you for all that you do for us. Of course, in Jesus' holy and precious name, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, church. Thank you. I, I'm so very thankful that God brought me here. You think you come to a place to bless people and then to realize that, that I'm blessed by them, blessed by you. To love on people, and I'm the one that's loved on, that's cared for, that's prayed for. So I'm so grateful for your prayers. You guys are prayer warriors. Um, and I know this. And, and from your voice and the way you ask, just the, it's not just a how are you doing to get by. It's, it's really a how are you when you guys ask me this, and I know this. So I'm so very thankful that this is where God has led us away from Michigan and the cold, as we say every time, because you think it's cold here? I, I have their weather app on my phone, 
And whenever I think it's cold here, I always remind myself of Berry and Springs. So those of my friends who are watching, may God be with you, especially today. <laughs> especially today. Let's open our Bibles to Isaiah, because that's, that's why we're here. It's to forget about the messenger and to always forget and to always remember the message. To remember the one who sent us, to remember the one who is good to us, to remember the one who thinks of us, as Rebecca said, to remember the one who, who thought of us even when we didn't think of him, to remember of our God. Isaiah 64, verse 8. Isaiah 64, verse 8. The potter's hand, clay. If you're there, please say amen. amen. We'll read this together. And the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 8, and it goes, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Pray with me now. Father, as we gather together, may our gaze be turned to you this morning. May our attention be drawn away from men, from women, and be drawn to you, the one that's unmovable, the one that's unchangeable, the one that's unwaverable, the one that can see us through this world, the one who has overcome the world. May we behold you this morning. May we forget of ourselves, of our weakness, of our doubts, of our fears. And may we remember that there is no fear in you, there is no doubt in you. There is only the assurance that you are with us as the potter who is here to mold us this morning in our lives. Bless us, the reading of your word. Bless this church as we learn more of you together. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I read this, this song this week, these past weeks. Some of you may know this song, some of you may, may not. And I, I heard this song and I looked at the lyrics and I'll read them to you because I thought about those lyrics. I thought about myself and I thought about the Christian experience and this is how it goes. It may be tough to read. It's been a tough week for us. But God is good. He's always good. He always sees us through. But this is what it says. Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line. With all the other not quites, with all the never get it rights. But it turns out they're the ones you were always looking for all this time. Because I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. And it goes, well, the more moral of the story is, everybody's got a purpose. So when I hear that devil start talking to me saying, who do you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. That, that is our call, that is, that is who I am, and that is who we are, just trying to tell some, trying to tell about somebody that saved us, that sees us through. The text today talks about clay, and I thought that was very fitting. When you think of clay, there's not much special there. And specifically in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah says, but now, O oh Lord, you are my father. Let's see, let's see if I have this one here. But now, O oh Lord, yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. He was talking to a people who were very rebellious at the time. Both Judah and Israel had completely forgotten God. And there were two groups of people. Two groups of people during Isaiah's time. Those who were said, I'm going to be faithful to God regardless of what happens. And those who had forsaken God. And it seems like there's always two groups. It doesn't matter if this is written over, you know, 2,000, 2,600 years ago, or if it's written today. There's always two groups. The book of Isaiah even echoes the book of Revelation, because there in Revelation 14, 7, the Bible says, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come, so worship him. 
who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. It says there's always a judgment coming, but let me tell you something. When somebody has done something wrong to you, you can't wait for that judgment day because judgment day is redemption day. It is not a day to be fearful. It is a day that you will be delivered. I've been to court several times. Not against me. As a police officer, let me clarify that in New Orleans. As a police officer, you go to court, and when you go to court because you know something has been done wrongly to you, you can't wait for that day to come. You, you look forward to that day that's coming very soon. Judgment is promise to that group who is faithful and who is near to God because God is coming. But then it picks a very interesting imagery. It picks what? What does it consider? I'll have this. What does it consider the people? It considers them what? Clay. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all works in your hands. have a plan for our lives. A purpose. A future. You promise you won't leave us. And when we face the tests and trials, you are there. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. And that's an interesting imagery. Clay, just a very common, ordinary material from Palestine. It's a sediment that was used for nothing too remarkable, bricks, streets, cements, and it was also used by the potter. There was nothing extraordinary about clay. There was nothing memorable. There was nothing remarkable about clay other than one thing, its pliability. It's ability to be shaped by the potter's will. Because if the clay is workable, it is valuable. But if the clay has hardened, if the clay is stubborn, then it cannot be worked. It's only used to be broken. So the modern dictionary, Webster Dictionary, if you look it up, but don't do it now on your phones, you can look it up. Webster it has two definitions about clay. I like the second definition a lot better, and you'll see why. The first de definition about clay is this, an earthly material that is plastic when moist but hard when fired, that is composed mainly of fine particles of hydrous aluminum, silicates, and other materials, minerals. And that's used for brick, tile, and pottery, specifically soil composed chiefly of this material having particles less than a specific size. Whew, that's a long definition. But this is the second definition, mud. I like that one. Mud. That's easier. It, it's just very simple. I remember when I was about 15, 16 years old, I was living in Brazil at the time by myself. My parents were here. I wanted to play soccer. So I was in Brazil 15 by myself. I had a car. I used to drive to work because I used to practice in the morning and in the afternoon, and I got paid for that. And I would go to night school at the time, completely by myself, a teenager doing whatever I wanted to do. And at the time, my friends, they, they had engaged themselves, and so did I, in, in, in the world, in freedom, freedom. 
And a lot of them got involved into hard drugs by the grace of God. I never did. But I got, got involved. They were doing whatever they wanted, and we went that route. But I said, Lord, if you're here with me, just... If you exist, started going to church at the time, show yourself. And I was playing soccer at a very, very small team, and that's the only reason why I was in Brazil. And then after a few months, I had this agent come to, to the team which I was in, and he said, I got a, a tryout for you. After I started going to church, he said, I have a tryout for you in one of the biggest teams in Brazil. It's called Santos. I know that doesn't mean much, but Pele came from Santos. Pele for us is like Michael Jordan for basketball. Okay, he is, if you think of soccer, he is the top, top. That's the team that he played for. You had young men, 15, 16 years old, making $200,000, $300,000 a month on that team. And I had a tryout for that team. I said, how is this possible? So I went, I tried out for them, and I passed the tryout. And at the time, I remember picking up my phone, calling my family. I said, I passed. All the work paid off. And, of course, you say, all the work, you're 15. I've been playing six, seven years. Like, really, you start as really, really, really young. And for some reason at that time, I knew that God was with me and that all that the world had to offer was just meaningless. It didn't, I didn't see the glimpse. I didn't see the glimmer. I only saw how God was good to me. And I remember picking up my phone and telling my parents and my family, I passed. And they had been already in the, in the U.S. for three years, and I had been in Brazil three years by myself just so I could do that. So I told them I passed, but I don't want to do this anymore. And they said, what do you mean? You were there by yourself. Like, this is why you did it. He said, no, 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 no. I'm giving my life to God. And I want to know where, I don't know what that means. I didn't even know what a pastor was. I had no idea. I just said, I want to work for him. I want to work for the church. I don't know what that entails. I don't know what that means. So from that day forward, 15, 16, I gave my life to Christ. And by the grace of God, I never looked back. And then some of my friends, of course, you invite them to come. They said, no, 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 it's too restrictive. I just want to be free. But you know what happened? Their freedom made them captives of addiction. Their freedom made them captives of, of disease for some of them. So the freedom that the world has to offer, it's, it's a very limited freedom. God's freedom is an everlasting freedom. They're not even death can take that away. So that's how God, and I said, you know, I'm going to allow you to mold me. Of course, I, at the time, I didn't know about clay and molding. You know, I'm 16, but I understand that now. It's a molding. It's a molding process. And there was three things Three things specific to this movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement church that made me so interested about it. And number one was that this church plays a particular role in the last days. And I really appreciate Elder Rennie. Last week, I heard and I watched some of it just talking about that role because there is a role for those people in Revelation 14, 12 that says this, that they keep the commandments of God and have what? The faith of Jesus Christ. It's very specific. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. There's not many people doing that. And then number two, there were these truths that had completely been forgotten. They were right there in the Ten Commandments, and they're right there in the Bible, but they were just completely forgotten. And I said, I want to know more about them because some people say that Jesus came to put the commandments to the cross. But then I read the Bible in Matthew 5, 17, and it says, Jesus said, I do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish. I came to what? To fulfill. So I'm reading all these things. And then number three is that this specific church, there is not one person who has all the responsibility for ministry for forgiving anybody else's sins. I was so glad that there's not one pastor, one reverend, one bishop, but there is a, something that's called the priesthood of all believers that we share in the ministry of God because every father is a minister to their children. Every mother ministers to their family. You minister in your workplace. As young people, you minister to your friends. So, so this church was just very peculiar to me, and I said, there is something interesting about these people. But I come to find out that we're not perfect, and I was surprised. I don't know why I was surprised. But Jeremiah, and you can turn there with me. In Jeremiah, there's only three verses that we're going to today. Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18 paints a beautiful picture, and I'll be honest, not many of us will be able to, to think about this. You, you're going to need some art artistic eyes to see this text. And there's only a few of you that will really be able to see this, as some of you are artists. In Jeremiah 18, you can start right there in verse 3. Look at what the Bible says. If you're there, say amen. 
so we can be together. All right, let's read it. Verse 3. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. Hmm. But the pot he was shaping from clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Notice this, the clay that he had chosen, the chosen clay was marred. It's not the clay that was on the streets. It was the clay chosen by the potter that was marred. It was the clay that remained, the remnant clay that was marred. What's interesting about that word marred, it has a few, a few definitions in the Hebrew, and a few of them are it was marred, destroyed, corrupted, or even ruined. I don't know what your translation says. Marred, just not where it was supposed to be. And what's interesting about it is that there is a process to the promise. That's where you start to notice, that there is a process to the promise of God, and clay work, if you've ever worked with clay, clay work is a process because of the promise. Let's be honest. The promise is very joyful. The promise that you're going to be a finished work of art done by the potter, that, that's a really great promise. The promise is we, we look forward to the promise, to that day that has maybe not arrived yet. And we look at that promise and our heart does what? It skips a beat because we think about it. We linger in it. We spend time in it because we know that the masterful worker is just shaping that clay according to his will. And let me say this, I know that I'm part, I am part of the greatest movement on earth. A movement that cannot be stopped by the gates of hell themselves, as Luther said. A movement that has been persecuted, struck, beaten. I am part of God's remnant people on this earth. I know that for a fact. But the God's men, remnant people may look like a bunch of nobodies to the non-trained non -trained eye. Because like a baptism, go, go, go there with me now with your minds, like a baptism on the Jordan River, there were those who did not know who that man was that was step, stepping into that river. There were those who did not know who the, the other man was that was about to baptize him, dressed in camel's hair and leather belt around his waist, about to baptize the man, just an ordinary man to the non-trained I, just a man from Nazareth, just a nobody from Nazareth, if you didn't know him, if you did not have the eyes to see on that day. Because on that very day, it wasn't a nobody that was stepping into the river. That was the somebody, Christ himself. But the, only, the ones who could see were the ones who were faithful, the ones who had asked, who, who were following God's who were following God, who were the believers. So this is what I believe. As Ellen White says, that there is but one church in the world who at the present time stands in the breach, making up the hedge, building up the waste places. Because at Seventh-day Adventists, we have a very simple call. As she says right there, the first sentence, Acts of the Apostles, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to what? To carry the gospel to the world. But clay work is a process because of the promise. The process begins with a formless chunk of clay that is completely useless and meaningless. For the potter sees the end of the project, but the clay cannot see but a step ahead of itself. The potter sees, but the clay doesn't. The clay only sees itself. Because you and I are the clay. Nobody's in the hands of somebody because in the process, there is a promise. And I was reading from this book called The Crushing. I thought it was very fitting for the times that we're living in. This is what this book, The Crushing, said. How can joy, talking about how the clay can be broken and cracked in the process. How can joy, utter, how can joy and utter anguish coexist? Why does pain cohabitate with blessing? God is good, this we know, for the Bible tells us so. But all the whys, we don't know.
One thing we do know, like Joseph, after being sold into slavery by his brothers, was reported as dead. And he said this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives which is similar to what Paul said, and we all know that all things work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose in Romans N28. But notice this, all things includes the hard, the painful, the unexpected, the seemingly unbearable, unimaginable, and those things that seem intolerable. All things includes the losses that you're grieving right now the ones you carry around you every day. All things includes the disasters, the divisions, and the distractions intruding on your peace of mind right now. All things include circumstances that leave you feeling powerless, vulnerable, and unsteady on your feet. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. All things. But then there's one last representation that I like to look at about this clay. That ordinary clay can be used for extraordinary things. If we go to John, John chapter 9. John chapter 9 has one of the most beautiful stories that I, that I read because it talks about the somebody using something that was meaningless to do something extraordinary. In John chapter 9, verse 6. And this is, this is just beautiful. We'll read it. John 9, verse 6. The Bible says, talking about Jesus healing somebody. After, after saying this, he, Jesus Christ, he spit on the ground. And may the greatest evangelist that was ever seen, was that what he said? No, no, no. He made the greatest presentation that was ever heard. No, 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 no. That's not what he says. Look at what the Bible says. He made mud with saliva and put it on the man's eye. Put it on the man's eye. Verse 10. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. How was it opened with just mud? Something ordinary being used for something extra ordinary. Because Ellen White comments on this, that there was no healing virtue in the clay. The virtue was in Christ himself. Amen. How to mold you, how to bend you, the potter knows you. He knows you specifically. He knows how to bend you as to not break you beyond repair. The process to you may look like destruction, but the process for the potter is construction. Even when we don't understand it, we are in the process. You are a work of art in progress this morning in this church. You're a work of art. I heard this this, this week about this uh, a bow and arrows, and this is what it said. It is the strength in which you are pulled back that determines how high you will fly. Do you feel as if you've been pulled back? Do you feel as if you're in the refining process? You're not being destroyed. You are being built. 2020 was a building year for the church. It was a refining year for the church to get closer with God because... Christ can be born in us. Our weakness becomes his space to be strong. God has chosen the foolish things in the world to make the wise foolish. The world can take away what is on the outside, but if Jesus is in us, the hope of glory, the prince of peace, what is in us will shape what is on the outside of us. This year, then, let us focus in the person of Jesus Christ, to be like Jesus, to love like Jesus, and if it is our lot to suffer like Jesus, because that's our calling. And then furthermore, our, our 
Ellen inspired Ellen White in Desire of Ages, eight, page, pages 815. This is what she says, and this is really remarkable. She wrote this, the question that Christ had put to Peter was significant. He mentioned only one condition of discipleship and service. Lovest thou me? He said, this is, in, is the essential qualification. Though Peter might possess every other, yet without love, the love of Christ, he could not be a faithful shepherd over the Lord's flock. Knowledge, benevolence, eloquence, gratitude, and zeal are all aids in the good work. But catch this. But without the love of Jesus in the heart, the work of the Christian minister is a failure. The minister in the home, the minister in the pulpit, the minister in the workplace. The love of Christ. So we need a revival of purpose from the potter. We need a revival of resolve from the potter. We need a revival of courage from the potter. A revival of love from the potter. Only a revival by the Holy Spirit can compel us to mission as the remnant people of God. So today, this is my appeal. Today, clay has a choice. To accept the potter's promise means to accept the potter's process. To accept the promise that he is molding us and shaping us for the greatest thing that the world has ever seen also means to accept the potter's slow, methodical process. Because the potter, as Ellen White describes, the potter takes the clay in his hands and molds and fashions it according to his own will. Put yourself in this. Maybe this is your life. He needs it and works it. He tears it apart. Do you feel torn apart today? Do you feel like every week it's another tearing? It's a little tearing here and a little tearing there. But it continues. He tears it apart and then presses it together. He wets it and dries it. He lets it lie for a while without touching it. Do you feel as if sometimes... You don't feel the touch of God, that God may be silent. He lets it lie for a little while for the process to take shape. And then she continues. When it is perfectly pliable, he continues the work of making from it a beautiful vessel. He forms it into shape and on the wheel trims and polishes it. He dries it in the sun and bakes it. In the oven. Thus it becomes a vessel unto honor, fit for use. So the great master molds us and fashions us. And this is this is good. It finishes like this. And as the clay is in the hands of the potter, so we are in his hands. We are not to try to do the work of the potter. Our part is to yield ourselves to the molding of the master. Master work. The promise is that this potter is coming very soon. The promise that the potter gives us that although the clay may seem fragile, which it is, you throw the pot down and it can break and it can shatter. But that potter is coming very soon to bring us home. But not just so. The one who made us from the foundations of the world, that even though when we go to be with him, we will be just perfect and that pot will be finished. There is one, there is one who will never, who will always bear marks on his hands to remember that process. The one who made us, the one who made from mud and clay, he made healing, he will always bear on his hands the process so that we don't bear on our bodies, on our minds, the scars of the process. He will bear it himself so that we don't have to bear it any longer. And then he does promise us. He promises us the whole world. Literally, he promises us the world, but not the world as we have it, a better world, a world that's unblemished, a world that's untouched, a world that no eye has seen, and no ear has heard. So as clay this morning and through this year, may we together, church, as family, because that's what we are. As I bring my, my little boy and we together, you pray for him, I pray for you. As family, we come to be molded by Christ as clay, pliable clay, clay that sometimes intermingles, 
clay that sometimes doesn't match up, but Christ comes in and just molds the clay according to his will. The people who have a special call into this world yield it to Christ and say, Lord, here I am. I yield myself to you so that you can mold me and shape me according to your likeness. That is my prayer this morning. That as we continue together forging ahead, clay has a choice. Will we choose life? Where do we want to be? So today I say, let us choose life. Let us choose the everlasting life with our King, with our Savior, with the one who molds us, our Lord Jesus Christ. May God be with you. I'd like to invite our worship team to come up and continue to, to guide us into worship. And as we sing and as we pray, have that prayer in your heart. Pick up the, the print from the Bible project. Let me put some foot to this. Take the Bible project that we're doing this year and read together and say, God, as I read these words, mold me according. And we have the printouts in the back. And we've been posting it on Facebook. Take it, spend time with God as we read the word. We can come up together and we will sing and we will praise God. Maybe we have a blessed Sabbath. Hymn number 567. Shall we all stand as we sing? Have I known where? ourselves we give all of us all that we are we give to you this morning mold us father please according to your image mold our children lord the ones who are here in this church the ones who have been the focus of the enemy please be with them wherever they are right now and as we look forward to the year 2021 if you are with us who can be against us Amen. we know that you forge ahead we know that you fight the battles for us. So, Father, place in us this trust in you so that we will not be afraid, but that we know that as the potter, you are also our warrior. You are also our king, also our redeemer and our deliverer. Be with us today as we journey with you in this year and as I begin together this new pastorate with Laurel. Father, thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for these people. It's wonderful, loving, loving people. May we just be like Jesus when you look to us. Amen. This we pray in his name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.